Welcome back, everyone, to Dark Readings News Desk Live from Black Hat 2023. I'm Becky Brackett, editor with Dark Reading. We're glad to have you join us for our series of conversations about the latest research being presented from the conference. Next up, I am thrilled to welcome Dustin Childs. He's back again this year to the Dark Reading News Desk, and he'll be talking about his Pond to Own hacking contest and more. Hello. Hi, Becky. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. So give us an update on Pond to Own and how it's going down here at Black Hat. Uh, sure. It's been a great year for Pond to Own. In Vancouver, in the March, we gave away a Tesla as well as $350,000 for the folks from Synactive who hacked that. It was a million-dollar show over three days, so that was fantastic. In October, we've got Pond to Own Toronto coming up. That's our consumer-focused one. Last year, we introduced the concept of the Soho Smash-Up category. So that's when you start from the external interface of a wireless router, you have to compromise the router and then pivot to something else internal to the network, a printer, a smart speaker, a NAS device. So it's really like the home office that we all now work in. It shows how an attacker can come from outside to really compromise your internal network at your house or your small office. And then we announced we're doing a new thing. Uh, in January, we are going back to Tokyo for Pone to Own Automotive. So beyond just Teslas, beyond just vehicles, we're looking at the systems and systems around EVs. So we'll have charge point EV stations there. We'll have ECUs, we'll have head units from like Alpine and Sony, uh, as well as a bunch of other targets. Tesla has signed on as a sponsor. Great. So we're thrilled for that. Uh, and cars these days are systems of systems. Uh, I just learned that there's industrial, uh, sorry, automotive grade Linux. I had no idea that there was automotive grade Linux. And like, I only knew it because I had a couple of researchers here earlier. There, there you go. <laughs> uh, but apparently if you've been driving a Mazda like from 2015 or newer, you're driving automotive grade Linux. So we wanna see what is the state of the art of the research when it comes to EVs and their components, especially the charging stations. I think that's an area where people really haven't looked at and there's a lot of voltage in those things. So. What could somebody do with a charging station under their control? Well, I mean, the most severe thing that they could do is they actually could so somehow start a fire. I mean, because you're looking at a lot of electricity running through that. Yeah. So if you were to remove the safeguards and things around that, I don't know if that's very likely. I hope it isn't. Uh, but you could also potentially damage the vehicle by either undercharging or overcharging it, uh, depending on what it's going. So, I mean, it's, there's the applications used by the chargers themselves. Uh, there's uh, low energy Bluetooth, which they use. Uh, there's the OCPP protocol, which they use to communicate on the internet. So there's all this attack surface and we really don't know. It hasn't even been investigated. Hasn't really been investigated very much. So we're gonna put a lot of money out there, invite people to Tokyo and then show us what they can do. Well, I'm excited to see what they can do. I am too. It's a lot of bread to put up. So oh yeah. It's pretty great. Okay, well let's uh, pivot a little bit. Sure. Um, since you are our vulnerab vulnerability guru, which is yes. easier said than done. Um, Tell us about the vulnerabilities. You mentioned middleware and you mentioned files, um, bugs in file format. Talk to me about those and why they're emerging and, and what we're doing about them. Sure, Becky. So one of the things that we've seen this year is we've seen bugs reported in middleware in the past. This year, we're seeing them being exploited in the wild. And really the first one was paper cut. Uh, and a lot of people had never heard of paper cut until it started getting exploited. But come to find out like every university in North America uses paper cut. And then I'm sure you've heard of move it. Uh, yeah, and then that happens. And again, I had never heard of Move It until it zero dayed and it got you know, really ramped up. Uh, and then we started buying bugs and Move It as well. And that's really what we're seeing. It's like the desktop and the perimeter are relatively solid at these days, but it's this interconnected tissue in the middle, that soft nuggety center, if you want to think of it that mm -hmm. way, that hasn't had a lot of, uh, it hasn't had a lot of people looking at it. It hasn't had a lot of research done in that area. And attackers are starting to see this now and starting to see that it's a soft target and they can go after it and it's a huge attack surface. We're finding out um, every day with yeah. the headlines, I've been covering it. And I've also been covering bugs in file formats, especially right. images I've seen a lot this year. Images, oh, well, that's the interesting thing about file formats these days is so there's so many applications that can open so many different types of file formats. So if you take just a JPEG and list out all of the things that can open a JPEG, it's astonishing. Uh, same for PDFs, same for Word docs or Excel files. We have AutoCAD software that's opening Excel files for some reason. Uh, and if you have a specially crafted PDF, for example, that can go a long way. And images, like you say, are another area where everybody wants to see an image, whether it's an email or in this document, they all want to be able to open these images. And there are so many image formats out there, not every application is opening very smartly. Uh, and you get a lot of applications that are vulnerable to these file formats because they are not following all of the specifications uh, or they don't understand the specification 
uh, or there's some one-off scenario, the way they open it. And the result is code execution when you open a file. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I also, you were mentioning the poor quality of security updates is yes. on your mind these days. It, so let's talk about that. Yeah, it still is. Last year, uh, we came to Black Hat and we talked about the poor quality of updates and how we were going to start introducing so shorter timelines for failed, what we consider to be failed patches. Right. We've started doing that, uh, and that has yet to really show any improvement. And if anything, I would say the quality of patches across the industry continues to decline. Why? That's a really hard question to answer. I think the biggest reason is it's hard, for one. People don't want to invest in the sustained engineering. They want to invest in the, the next product. Uh, they also don't have a lot of accountability for, there's no users clamoring for heads to roll when there's a bad patch. They just want the next patch. Right. Uh, so it's, it's kind of both a lack of accountability and a lack of, you know, really people don't want to do it. So I really think it's going to come to a situation in the very near future where one of two entities is going to get really involved and one is legislation and there's going to be some legislation introduced to have a min bar for security patches. The other one is cyber insurance. Mm -hmm. Because say, for example, you apply a, a patch and that patch is easily bypassed and your enterprise gets compromised and then you file an insurance claim for $250 million of damages, which is a quarter of the largest insurance claim that's ever been warded. So really, very realistic. Uh, if I'm a cyber insurer and I understand that scenario, I can very see a good possibility where the cyber insurance starts going after the vendors to get reimbursed for liability because it was a bad patch that allowed that attacker to go through. Let me ask you this, because I hear a lot about how cyber insurance is sort of this quasi entity putting guardrails in on these things and really pushing um, for changes and pushing for shoring mm -hmm. up defense. Is that too much to ask of cybersecurity? It seems almost like because it's a business and an do easy dollar attached right. sell to the C-suite that are we asking them to do too much and are we putting a lot of eggs in a maybe uh, a basket of insurers that are not techie or interested in paying out? Yeah, I attended a cyber, security, uh, cyber insurance conference earlier this year and it was very eye-opening for me because it is a very immature industry. Like I sat with a couple people and they were talking and like, let me just bounce a couple words off you, see if it means anything. Sasser, Blaster, Conficker. And they're like, nope, nope, got nothing. And they just don't have this historical knowledge. Yeah. I do think it's good that we're trying to set a minimum bar. Like to get cyber insurance, you have to have a vulnerability management program. You have to have this, you have a to have playbook. that. Yeah, you have to have a playbook. Uh, you have to have, uh, you know, an incident response vendor, at least on call, you know, that sort of thing. So I think we need to refine what that is. And I think we're gonna go through a few years of pendulum swings one way or the other, too much, not enough, mm -hmm. as we do this. Hopefully we can get on that, that sweet spot, you know, for the baby bear in the bed where it's comfortable. Right, right, okay. Now I'm going to, we just have a couple of minutes left. I wanted to ask you about CDI's uh, partnership with Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Microsoft is getting a lot of flack and, yep. and they're, they're aware uh, yes. by all reports that they need to do some work. What are they doing and what is your impression of what they can do and are doing? So my, I'm not here to bash Microsoft in their response. Uh, I used to work at Microsoft. I used to be in MSRC and shipped updates. Uh, I shipped the Conficker update. Actually, it was my case. So I feel a lot for them. They know they have problems and one of the things that we talked about with Microsoft here at this conference is what can we as ZDI do to help improve the process? So we're looking at different things, whether it be API improvements, whether it be monthly meetings, whether it be just re-education for certain things, uh, to help improve the process, uh, to help uh, the quality of patches, uh, help the quality of the updates that go out. They know they have issues, but what can the community do besides just get you know, shout from the ivory tower. It's like, you guys stink. Yeah. I mean, that's easy to do. Not helpful. Uh, but really, it's not helpful. But what can we do to make them better? Because obviously, these Microsoft updates impact everyone. everyone. It impacts their customers. It impacts our customers, your readers, you know. So what can we do to make the world a better place? And ZDI is essentially the, the biggest contributor to Microsoft when it comes to vulnerability reports. So we are uniquely positioned to really help them. Uh, and we're invested in doing that. And that's something that we want to do. And we want to do that for the whole industry as well. I mean, we don't just hold Microsoft accountable. We try to hold everyone equally accountable, including Trend Micro. Uh, so we don't take ourselves off the hook either. Wonderful. Well, there aren't very many people I could do quite that 
ring around the entire <laughs> cybersecurity industry in 10 minutes or less. So I thank you for your expertise and your time. No problem, Becky. Always happy to be here and talk with you. All right. We'll see you again next year. Absolutely.